Hi guys, welcome to today's MCQ discussion, MCQ discussion number 12. Let's get started. So the first question, which of the following is used to estimate liver function? A. Glucose tolerance test, B. Fructose tolerance test, C. Galactose tolerance test or D. Lactose tolerance test. So pause, think, try to answer, and then we'll discuss. Okay, so the answer here is B. Galactose tolerance test. So remember, galactose tolerance test is used to assess or estimate liver function. We always read about glucose, rarely about galactose, and that's why it's frequently asked. So let's talk a little bit about the galactose tolerance test. So remember, the galactose tolerance test is done to assess liver function. So it's a liver function test, basically. And the principle behind the galactose tolerance test is that it is only and only the liver that metabolizes galactose in the body. So principle is that galactose is a monosaccharide that is exclusively metabolized by the liver in case of liver disease there is impaired or reduced function of the liver which means there will be impaired metabolism of galactose so remember liver was the only organ which metabolizes galactose and when the functioning of the liver reduces metabolic or meta metabolization of galactose will also reduce and this results in an increased blood galactose and an increased urinary galactose so galactose is not metabolized so the blood levels and urinary levels of galactose will increase so let's look at this once more so normally the liver con converts galactose into glucose and this glucose can be utilized by the cells so every nearly every cell in the body can utilize glucose or metabolize glucose but remember it's only the liver that can convert this galactose into a utilizable glucose and in case of liver, liver disease, this conversion or this process stops. So this starts increasing in the body. Okay. And when this galactose increases in the body, you'll have increased blood galactose. And finally, the galactose gets excreted by urine. So you'll have increased urinary galactose. So this principle or this exclusivity of galactose metabolism and the liver is what this galactose tolerance test is used for. And that's why it's a liver function test. So let's look at the procedure of what is exactly done. Not to the numbers are not too important. The principle is more important. So remember, you give 40 gram galactose orally. Sometimes it can be given intravenously, but usually you give 40 gram galactose orally. And for the next few hours, you take serial urinary samples and check for the galactose levels. So if there is a total of less than three gram in five hours, that is less than three gram galactose in the urine in five hours, then it means it's normal. If you find more than three grams of galactose in urine after five hours of giving galactose, it indicates there is some impaired liver function. Could be any liver pathology, but remember, if there is more than three gram after five hours, it indicates some liver disease. So let's go to the second question of the day. Number two, a 30 year old woman presence with nausea, urinary frequency, urinary urgency, and burning micturation. Which of the following additional findings would be suggestive of pyelonephritis in this patient? A. Fever, B. Pyuria, C. WBC casts, or D. Sterile pyuria. So pause, think, and then we'll discuss. Yeah, so first, let's look at the history. So a woman, 30-year-old woman, presents with nausea, urine increased frequency, urgency, and burning maturation. So the minute we see all these symptoms, increased bur burning maturation, frequency, urgency, and nausea, include yes, including nausea, you think about a UTI. So nausea is also seen in UTI, so you're, always, you're thinking of a urinary tract infection. But here, they have actually already given you the diagnosis. They think it's a pyelonephritis. So what additional feature, if you add to these symptoms of UTI, would make you suspect that it is not a UTI alone, but a pyelonephritis? So what would make you think that is a pyelonephritis? So let's look at the options now. Fever can be there in both. So this is not the answer. Pyuria, that means bacteria in urine. So bacteriuria, again, it can be there in both pyelonephritis and just a simple UTI. So it is not pyuria. WBC cast, let's put that aside. And sterile pyuria means there is high WBC count or lymphocytes in the urine. Pyuria also means high lymphocytes in the urine, but sterile pyuria means even if you culture this urine, you won't get any organism. So it is a high WBC count, but non-culturable or you don't yield any organism. So sterile pyuria definitely is not indicative here. And pyuria or bacteriuria, either of them 
can be seen in both so the answer must be c wbc casts so remember wbc casts are definitive or indicative of pyelonephritis so in this question if this woman has wbc casts in her urine then it means she has pyelonephritis so i have included this question to talk about a very very important and very high yield topic and those are the urinary casts and that's why this question was included also it's a previous any question so what are these urinary casts so remember these urinary casts are nothing but some cylindrical shaped mucoproteins that are produced in the renal tubular cells and they get excreted in the urine and they are diagnostic of certain conditions so remember urinary casts are cylindrical aggregations of mucoproteins and sometimes mucoproteins with cells that are formed in the distal nephron okay either the dct or the collecting ducts so let's go back to the question we are suspecting or we are confused between uti and pyelonephritis so remember these wbc casts or any casts are usually formed in the distal nephron okay and since they are formed in the distal nephron that means for these casts to be present the distal nephron has to be involved and if the distal nephron is involved or an infection of the distal nephron is nothing but or an infection of the nephron is, or the renal tissue is nothing but pyelonephritis and that's why the answer is wbc cast so only when the nephron is involved will you have wbc cast and therefore in this case only if there are wbc cast will we think that it is a pyelonephritis otherwise if there are no wbc cast we will mostly consider this as just a uti urinary tract infection now we are thinking about a kidney infection if not for these wbc cast we will think it's a normal urinary tract infection so again remember they are formed in the urinary casts are cylindrical mucoproteins or cylindrical aggregations of mucoproteins sometimes have cells in them and they are formed in the distal nephrons particularly the dct distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts okay so how are these urinary casts formed so they are formed by precipitation of something called tam hausfeld mucoproteins so remember tam hausfeld mucoproteins are the most commonly secreted proteins in the urine they are physiologically being secreted but when there are some disease conditions these will precipitate to form casts okay so precipitation of tam hausfeld mucoproteins is the cause for urinary cast formation okay and these can be identified on urinary microscopy hence there are diagnostic tool and different types of casts are seen and they are indicative of different pathology so based on the types of casts you can think of different types of disease so remember again there are two casts or two types of urinary casts first one is the cellular cast and second one is the air cellular cast so the cellular casts are the casts which have mucoproteins or cylindrical structures of mucoproteins with cells embedded in them or with cells that are part of them and air cellular casts have no cells as part of them so what are the as important air cellular casts you have the hyaline cast the granular cast the waxy cast and the fatty cast so four important a cellular casts hyaline cast granular cast waxy cast and fatty cast and cellular cast include rbc cast wbc cast bacterial casts again in, in infections and epithelial casts now we'll talk about each of these in little detail or just in enough detail for the neat exam so firstly what are the hyaline casts remember these are very smooth and clear casts they do not have cells they are acellular cast right so hyaline casts are acellular casts they are smooth and clear casts they have a cylindrical shape and they are mostly they are mostly composed of only tam hausfeld proteins and they can be seen sometimes in normal normally in individuals i told you tam hausfeld proteins are physiologically excreted and they are the largest uh, uh, proteins excreted in the urine so they can be seen normally in urine and sometimes with severe exercise in patients who are taking diuretics and even in dehydration see dehydration and diuretics can cause precipitation of these proteins to form these cylindrical structures so hyaline casts smooth and clear casts can be seen physiologically but usually seen with exercise diuretics and dehydration remember the most common type of urinary casts are hyaline casts again because it can be found physiologically obviously it would be the most common right so the second cast we'll talk about other granular casts again they are a type of acellular cast remember they have these kinds of granules they are easily visualized compared to hyaline casts hyaline casts are very clear these are not so clear and they are cigar shaped you can see here they are a little bit blunted towards the end so they are cigar shaped granular casts they are, they are composed of mainly degenerated proteins and they can be seen in chronic renal failure acute tubal necrosis and sometimes even with severe exercise so remember severe exercise 
acute tubular necrosis and chronic renal failure these are granular and they are cigar shaped and when they are muddy brown if they are muddy brown it's more particular or more indicative of acute tubular necrosis next the most important cast from the neat exam point of view or the most asked cast from the neat exam point of view is the broad cast or the waxy cast so remember these are just like your hyaline cast but they are a lot broader and a lot more visible and one one point you have to remember broad casts are indicative of renal failure so presence of which casts have the worst prognosis it is a broad cast so remember if you see broad cast the prognosis for that patient is the worst and presence of broad cast because they are so large are indicative of chronic renal failure so only when the situation is bad do you see broad cast waxy cast again is another name usually they are used interchangeably but remember waxy cast can be a little narrower or little smaller also and they can be seen in renal amyloidosis so renal amyloidosis waxy cast broad cast chronic renal failure so any time you see waxy and broad cast you should think of chronic renal failure and this is the most important cast we'll discuss about okay lastly the last acellular cast called the fatty casts okay so these contain lipid droplets you can see here these contain lipid droplets or it's also called oval fat bodies and presence of fatty casts usually indicates nephrotic syndrome so we know what nephrotic syndrome is usually seen in children and if you see fatty casts in a clinical history you should or in a question you should think of nephrotic syndrome sometimes rarely can be associated with hypothyroidism also but remember if you have to remember one thing it is nephrotic syndrome then the cellular casts okay all of these are important firstly the rbc casts they contain rbcs and they are seen in glomerular nephritis the wbc casts what we discussed here are they contain wbcs and they are seen in pyelonephritis and even in interstitial nephritis but remember pyelonephritis and the epithelial casts are seen in acute tubular necrosis remember epithelial casts contain the tubular epithelium and they are seen in acute tubular necrosis so there is necrosis of the tubular epithelium so they are in the cast so remember casts are aggregations of mucoproteins which are cylindrical in shape they are formed in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct they may be cellular or acellular under the acellular casts you have the hyaline cast which appears smooth and clear can be seen physiologically may be associated with diuretics and dehydration this is the most common type granular class casts are granular cigar shaped and they are seen with severe ex uh, exercise atn especially if muddy brown they are seen with acute tubular necrosis and chronic renal failure the most important broad waxy casts or broad casts seen in chronic renal failure worst prognosis fatty casts seen in nephrotic syndrome among the cellular casts rbc casts seen in glomerular nephritis remember the glomerular injury is there in glomerular nephritis and hence rbcs can go into the into the urine usually associated with hematuria also wbc casts indicative of pyelonephritis and epithelial cast indicative of acute tubular necrosis now a picture you can make out each of these rbc cast contains rbc wbc cast contains wbc this is the most important i wanted to make out it is a clear but a broad cast and this is the one which is mostly asking questions if you see this you should always think of chronic renal failure and epithelial cast and hyaline cast again very important they are clear and smooth little more difficult to see last question for today is a 60 year old man who is a known case of diabetes mellitus since 20 years comes to you with this lesion over the foot in the image which of the following is a is not a contributing factor is not a contributing factor for the development of this condition a neuropathy b venous stenosis c hyperglycemia and d ischemia pause think then we'll discuss so very straight forward question to end it with so that you know we can relax in the end so this is nothing but your diabetic foot right anybody who's done the internship can see this even who are not in internship can just look at this image and know that it is a diabetic foot and you are also getting a history of long term diabetes 20 years and this like i said diabetic foot ulcers usually develop over the great toe and near the metatarsals and this is typical for a diabetic foot ulcer it has a nice punched out edges it looks more like a trophic ulcer so diabetic foot ulcer is also a type of trophic ulcer so there are three contributing factors to formation of diabetic ulcers first is hyperglycemia okay which leads to immunocompromise so more chance of developing this second is neurovascular or neural uh, neural involvement that is peripheral neuropathy due to which there will be less of less sensation so the area is prone to repeated trauma the sensation in that region reduces so the area is prone to repeated trauma chance to develop ulcer and the third thing which contributes is ischemia and this ischemia is due to peripheral vascular disease or atherosclerosis of the vessels so remember three things hyperglycemia neural compromise and vascular compromise so these three things together lead to diabetic foot ulcer so that's it for today thank you see you on friday